you, um, everybody. Nice to see you this morning. So I'm going to be picking up on many of the areas, actually, that uh, Gautier was talking about. So for those who don't know us, we are environmental economists, and we work with companies and investors to look at natural capital risks and quantify natural capital risks and opportunities. And what I'm going to be talking about today is how we can quantify the positive. Because obviously, in the transition to a low-carbon economy, we need capital to, to flow from... Um, from the, the grey economy into a greener economy and being able to de determine and make decisions between different investments, which ones will help us move um, in, that, in the right direction and where can we make the biggest impact is absolutely vital. <coughs> so um, the types of... Um, we, we're finding that clients are asking this a lot more at the moment. So the types of um, uh, questions that we get from clients... Um, we work with a lot of pension funds who are trying to decarbonise. So if they're taking money out from, um, from maybe from divestment or they are re-optimising their investments away from um, the more carbon intensive uh, investments, then where do they reallocate that capital? And it often inv involves other asset classes. So green bonds has been particularly um, of interest recently. So how do we reduce the, the negatives over here and increase the positives? Um, so... Being able to quantify the positives is absolutely vital. Um, another area is um, we work with a lot of development finance institutions, so one of which is um, IFU, the Danish um, Development Bank. The Danish government's been asking them for, uh, we well started asking them about three years ago for more metrics about this money that we give you that you invest um, in, in the climate fund, what actually quantifiably is the benefit? How much carbon are we taking away here? So what we've been doing over the last few years is to develop techniques to be able to do this. Um, and we can do this at the asset level, and you, you can apportion um, tonnes of carbon saved um, at the asset level and um, amortise that over the life of the investment to understand per year tonnes of carbon saved per million euros of investment or financing. So how do we do that? Because that sounds so simple. Um, OK, so... If we use the example of a, a wind farm, obviously there's, um, over the life cycle of that wind farm, we know that the biggest savings come in the uh, in-use phase. So when that wind farm is operational, how much um, energy is it um, producing and what the carbon emissions associated with that compared to the traditional grid mix. So the, the idea is to look over the whole life cycle of that um, asset to understand what the net carbon position is. So we mustn't forget the fact that um, building a wind farm creates carbon, it's an industrial process, it creates carbon emissions. So we look at the, the, the building and construction phase as well as the in-use phase. But how do you know what that's actually saving in terms of tonnes of carbon? So the greenhouse gas protocols for projects has actually got some very good guidelines and frameworks that are good points of reference for, for how to do this. And the, the key word in that is additionality. So if that wind farm isn't there, what would be the case otherwise? What does that wind farm displace? Which means that you need um, a baseline. Um, what, and that baseline and the selection of that baseline is absolutely vital. So this um, is a picture from the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, um, which talks about how you can approach um, defining that baseline. So in the case of the wind farm, the baseline would be what's the grid mix of the existing country. So if people are going to be using their electricity anyway, where would that, what would the carbon emissions be of the grid mix of where they are, so where that wind farm is. So that means that the exact same wind farm in Sweden or in India will have completely different carbon savings because they're displacing um, different amounts of carbon um, in the, because they've got different grid mixes. So that um, is important because obviously in the transition to a low carbon economy, we want to get the biggest bang for our buck and we need to be looking at where we can make the biggest savings and make the biggest difference. But it does create a challenge in that, um, that, that you've got a different goalpost in different locations. It also creates challenges, as, as Gauthier alluded to, in that that can change over time. So, for example, here in France, um, the same, very same investment now compared to in five years' time will have, um, in five years' time, the 
carbon saving has diminished because the grid mix here has got greener. So the baseline keeps moving, the goalposts keep moving, um, which creates a communications challenge. If you've made that choice at point zero in time, how do you communicate then to investors going forwards five years down the line that actually that benefit has decreased? Obviously, we need to have that baseline decreasing. That's part of the transition to a low-carbon economy. And actually, these are the types of investments that also help to move that baseline. So um, something to bear in mind when we're selecting baselines is, um, is that they move and the goalposts move. There are other challenges as well when we think about scope. So moving away from our wind farm example for a moment, um, when we think about sort of green claims, um, we need to think about the, uh, of, of the in-use phase of products. We need to think about how um, valid that is and also how many variables there are. So, for example, if we're looking at um, uh, an, an asset and the, the part of the investment thesis is that um, it's going to ha um, have a positive environmental impact, if it's later proven that it doesn't actually have a environmental, positive environmental impact, the investment thesis begins to break down. So, with um, first-generation solar panels, they kind of sounded green, thought they were green, but actually when it gets to the disposal phase, they're not so green after all. So if part of the thesis is that the, these are greener and therefore they're going to do better, um, then it totally falls down if you then get an NGO turn around and say, actually, not so green after all. So it's very important that we can think about greenwashing as well. Um, so how do we over, overcome that? So when we're thinking about the in-use phase, what we need to think about is the... Um, the likelihood of different outcomes being there. So if we're looking at a, a washing powder, that should only be washed, uh, it will save carbon emissions because everybody can wash their clothes at 30 degrees. The likelihood of behaviour change is something that's very difficult to measure, but it's something that you'd need to factor in in quantifying the, the, the carbon savings there. Oh, my pic. Oh, here we go. Right, so traps to avoid. I'm just going to put them all up here at the same time. So... Um, Things which sound green, and this is particularly important actually in, in, the, in the green bond space where we have um, package, packaged up investment products, but thinking about th something that is um, using sustainable materials, but actually in an unsustainable way. So beginning this quantification process enables you to compare um, different types of greenness, the scale of greenness, and also be able to look within a category that sounds green to be able to disaggregate, well, projects that are greener than others. So that's a bit complicated. An example, bamboo clothing. Um, bamboo fibres are often cited as being a much more sustainable um, pro um, sort of product. But a lot of bamboo fibres are actually treated in a chemical process which is actually very unsustainable. Not always, but it means that you have to look beneath the typology of a particular product or a particular asset to understand actually whether that has a benefit or not. Um, similarly, there can be claims about benefits when something is different to um, something might actually be illegal now. So um, this links back to the, the point about the changing benchmark in that um, some if the so for example the light bulbs. If a company claims that they've got light bulbs that are um, conventional uh, that are, are, are much greener than conventional light bulbs and that has a big carbon saving, the protocol for projects would argue that actually, now that the EU has outlawed those um, conventional light bulbs, there isn't actually any saving because there's no additionality, because actually the goalpost has moved, you have to make the greener light bulbs. So this is really just highlighting that there are pitfalls from a typology approach and actually quantifying carbon emissions over the life cycle of an, um, of an investment can help avoid accusations of greenwashing and also can help us to make the biggest difference and make better decisions about what will actually help us the most in the transition to a low carbon economy. And of course you can do that at a portfolio level um, and quantify that for different assets so that you can get a, a communications metric. So I've got one minute and probably down to 30 seconds now, so I'm just going to summarise very broadly. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to summarise uh, very broadly. The, there are pitfalls from greenwashing, but we need to be able to um, move through that. If we can quantify carbon emissions at the asset level, at the investment level, at the portfolio level, and we can quantify the savings, then it helps us to bring mm -hmm. another... Um, it, it provides us with um, a, a more scientific... Um, basis for making some of our decisions but we need data and more data from the assets and from companies to help us to make these quantifications thank you